Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 31st lecture of surface engineering. Uh, we have discussed uh, various processes. We are now actually uh, considering various types of uh, coating processes uh, possible. Uh, we have done with mostly so far mostly with the uh, interstitial elements and now we are going to go into a different types of uh, coating which are branded as diffusion coating. But before we go into the coating processes and uh, the mechanism and the motivations, I first would like to pose uh, or say a few words as to why diffusion coating is so important for one of the uh, most uh, elegant engineering machine that we can think of. So if you look at this uh, view graph, what you are seeing here is uh, an engineering view of uh, jet turbine engine. So, this is the compressor part through which you suck in air and uh, uh, perpendicularly you feed in fuel and then at the specific combustion chamber the, the air and uh, fuel uh, they are mixed and uh, led to combustion and that creates the thrust and this is happening at the high temperature zone the uh, basically the combustion zone and these materials uh, while in the uh, compressor part is made up of these blades are made up of titanium alloys because the temperature expected is less than 500 degrees centigrade somewhere around 350 400 degrees centigrade whereas the combustion zone we expect easily the much higher temperature say uh, uh, to the tune of uh, 1050 degrees centigrade. Now at such high temperature in order to maintain the integrity and life and reliability of the component, this is a very major task. Primarily because of the high temperature and also very aggressive environment uh, because of the presence of oxygen and other oxidizing elements. So, it is probably not an exaggeration to say that the turbine engine is really one of the biggest engineering marvels. And in particular, the materials that make up this compressor part and in particular the combustion zone, the turbine blades, uh, they, they truly represent one of the biggest triumphs of materials engineering. For one single reason, the turbine blades are made up of uh, usually by uh, nickel based super alloys. So, this uh, red uh, colored region represents the nickel based super alloys which contains easily about 8 to 10 elements of very different melting temperature, uh, density, uh, thermophysical properties like specific heat and so on, uh, vapor pressure and also including some of the interstitial elements. To have all those uh, 8 to 10 uh, elements into a single solution and retain them uh, through a process of solidification which leads to not only a usual polycrystalline aggregate but actually a single crystal is uh, enormously difficult. Yet these uh, blades which actually make up the, uh, the turbine part of the, uh, the, the blades for the turbine at the combustion zone, they are made from single crystal nickel based super alloys. Now, protection of these alloys at that high temperature and high oxidizing condition is a major issue. So, in all these major uh, uh, engineering progresses, we actually have to realize that none of these materials that we use are a monolith. So, they actually first of all they are multi-component systems and then they, there are interfaces. So, we actually need to combine say titanium with nickel or we as we move from one region to another 
the kind of materials that we use change from place to place. So, the outer shell can be uh, the made of aluminum, some other load bearing components which are uh, not exposed to high temperature can be made of composites. We do use steel quite a large extent, but as I said the compressor part is made up of titanium alloys and the combustion zone. The, uh, the turbines are made from nickel based super alloys. So, multiple uh, types of alloys and materials. So, we need since we have multiple types of materials we have interfaces and they need to be compatible with each other. So, the materials that we use they must offer the right kind of properties and as a result of which we can ensure the life of the component, the reliability the performance, the efficiency and the overall success. So, for any hardware whether it is a turbine engine or a machine at room temperature or a tiny little component sensing some gases in all those hardwares ultimately we must realize that it is the material which holds the key for the success because uh, the kind of functionality that we want to derive will depend upon whether the uh, the material, the inherent material is able to perform to the extent desired. In this particular case, while we are discussing high temperature protection of uh, metallic components, we first should realize that as we expose metals to high temperature, they have a natural tendency of converting into oxides, because that is how they are stabler in terms of the Gibbs energy. So, when we reduce and win metal from those oxides and yet expose them to high temperature, all these metals will have a natural tendency of going back into the more stabler form which is primarily the oxides. And the job at hand is how we protect them at high temperature and that to one of the highest possible temperature where any kind of metallic system is exposed to for any type of engineering application. So, the protection actually comes from diffusional coating or so called diffusion coating. So, at this point we have been talking about multiple uh, processes surface engineering processes including carburizing, nitriding and so on which are diffusion based and I did mention the importance of diffusion in such cases, but let us take a look at the exact uh, mechanism and the kinetics of diffusional processes. So, there are two types of diffusion one can think of when we actually have a steady state diffusion and also a situation where we can have an unsteady state diffusion. So, that means, where the, the composition between two specific points changes or does not change. If it does not change then we say steady state diffusion and if it changes with time then we say non steady state or unsteady state diffusion. So, in a steady state situation we all know that we refer to the fixed first law where the flux uh, per unit area will be proportional to the compositional gradient and of course, d is the diffusional uh, diffusion coefficient. The negative sign as we all know is because of the fact that um, composition actually decreases uh, down the distance. To be more precise actually the the uh, diffusion rate depends uh, more upon the, um, the partial molar uh, free energy or the chemical component. So, essentially diffusion occurs down the chemical potential gradient, but herein we since uh, there is uh, we are not bringing the enthalpy component for our discussion here, we simply can say that the flux of diffusion under steady state will be proportional to the composition gradient. In the non steady state, where we have applied a finite quantity of diffusant, then over a period of time the diffusant or the diffusing atom will uh, the amount of it available for diffusion will reduce. And as it reduces, then obviously the uh, potential the chemical potential uh, gradient or the composition gradient also changes. So, that is what is known as unsteady state. So, typically if the if the steady state is maintained, then we have uh, we, we, we see that over a distance the composition remains along the line C D, but as the composition changes with distance that is the typical uh, non steady state uh, or with time that is the situation when we have uh, uh, the 
So initially, if this is the kind of profile we have in the solid, then after a period of time when uh, everything, uh, the, the solute atoms have mixed well in the system and have come to a, a steady state, then we will end up in a situation where the composition will be governed by this line C D. But in the beginning, we'll, when we have a definite gradient, that is enough of a reason for diffusion to occur. So, as we say that fixed first law governs the diffusion under steady state, the fixed second law governs the diffusion kinetics for the non-steady state situation. So, here we are bringing the time component. So, compositional change as a function of time actually uh, through this mathematical uh, uh, exercise can be expressed in the following form where d c d t the change in composition with time will be proportional to the uh, second derivative of composition with distance. So, d 2 c d x 2 and obviously, d is the diffusional coefficient. So, under very specific boundary conditions we can find an error function solution for the composition profile as a function of distance x and time t small t and this is how we actually can uh, find out what is the concentration at a given distance or a, at a given time at a, at a uh, particular distance. So, these kind of uh, solutions are uh, actually very important for us to determine what will be the depth of diffusion, what is the profile of diffusion and so on and so forth. So, while talking about diffusion, we must not forget that we are talking about essentially two types of possibilities. One is where the species is so small that it does not need to displace any existing lattice atom and create a vacancy. So, there are interstitial holes available and the species uh, being so small, they can find their way through and go into go and sit into those interstitial positions. But this cartoon actually shows much bigger than what in usual situation we see as uh, the possible size of the void available for interstitial atom accommodation. In other words, all I am trying to say is that interstitial atom invariably will be bigger than the interstitial hole diameter that is available. So, as a result, each atom that diffuses into an interstitial position will create a, st a strain st a stress field around and as a result, the solubility will be restricted. But uh, the important point here is that these elements carbon, nitrogen, boron or for that matter even hydrogen and oxygen, they all are much smaller than the usual lattice atoms or diameter of a lattice atom in a metallic system. So, they can find themselves uh, easy to get accommodated in the interstitial positions and that is what we call as interstitial diffusion. On the other hand, when we talk of uh, other atoms uh, like um, aluminum, silicon, chromium, manganese, zinc or all kinds of other rest of the elements, they size wise will be comparable to the size of the uh, atoms uh, in the lattice sitting in the lattice. So, then you require the other kinds of mechanism which is called vacancy exchange mechanism. So, if you have a vacant spot here, this position was lying vacant for whatever reasons the atom which is supposed to be here probably managed to go into the surface or probably moved out to another place and left behind a vacancy. So, in such a situation it is easier for an species which is coming from outside either from the vapor phase or the liquid phase or even solid, space, solid state, they, it actually finds a position here and from here when it wants to go to the next position instead of directly going here, it will always try to go and exchange with the vacant position. So, if this is a vacant position and this is an atom, we what we see usually is a tendency of uh, exchange. So, when the atom hops to a vacant position, it occupies the vacant position and then substitutes a vacancy and in the process creates a vacancy here. So, this is applicable to all the atoms which size wise which are size wise comparable to the existing lattice atoms. And for such uh, uh, elements uh, when we talk of uh, diffusional process, we have to realize the corresponding um, activation barrier which is typically in a typical reaction coordinate we will say that this is the so called activation barrier and this barrier is usually higher for say aluminum than say copper. Why so? 
because for substitution or diffusion, you first have to create a vacancy. So, you spend energy in creating a vacancy either by the same process or must have been done earlier. So, you budget that energy component also into it. So, that uh, the amount of energy required to create a, a vacancy is a part of vacancy based diffusional mechanisms or so called exchange uh, mechanism. So, the activation barrier in the process is higher. So, the Q for uh, substitutional diffusion will be higher than the Q or the activation energy for interstitial diffusion. And as a result, we all uh, are aware that uh, substitutional diffusion coefficient will be smaller than the diffusion coefficient for interstitial atom diffusion at comparable conditions of temperature. So, keeping this in mind, we also should realize that when we are talking about interstitial diffusion, then exact quantity or the concentration is important, but not so important. But when we talk of uh, substitutional atoms, then we divide them into categories like uh, impurity diffusion, where the amount of diffusion is very small or chemical diffusion, where the amount of diffusion is larger. So, there are different other categories of diffusion. So, this background was necessary for us to relate well to the process of diffusion coating. Now, coating is essentially creation of an extraneous layer on top of an existing solid. So, this is an addition based surface engineering. So, in this diffusion and when we talk of diffusion coating immediately you will think about the elements like aluminum, silicon and chromium, because these three elements have very high affinity for oxygen and in the Illingham's diagram of uh, uh, standard Gibbs energy as a function of partial molar energy of oxygen. If you plot, you will see that these lines are usually always much lower than all other oxide lines for metals. So, which means that they are the most stable oxides or if you have competition between a cation, some cation and a aluminum for oxygen, obviously oxygen will win over because they have a higher affinity and also the oxide is stabler. So, Taking Q from this discussion, all the diffusion coatings which are used to protect, for example, the turbine blades at 1050 degree centigrade, they are usually based on some uh, coating which will have one of these elements, usually aluminum, because aluminum has very high affinity for oxygen. It creates an oxide layer on top and this oxide layer will protect further ingress of oxygen from atmosphere into the metal and as a result further oxidation or loss of metal will be prevented. So, this is the way we protect against high temperature and high temperature oxidation primarily which is a single electrode process or can be corrosion also possible at high temperature. So, aluminum coatings can be applied as an alloy for example, aluminum silicon eutectic alloy for various wear resistant can be for wear resistant applications as well, but usually these aluminum silicon eutectic alloys are applied when wear resistance is uh, an intention or objective. But coatings on steel for high temperature also are based on aluminum for example, the automobile exhaust obviously here we are talking about a few hundred degrees centigrade certainly not very high temperature. Now, we also, so diffusion coating essentially is a process of uh, development of a coating which is based on uh, species diffusion from surface into the interior. Conversion coating is a process which also uh, is widely used for protection of metallic substrates uh, in corrosive or oxida oxidative or even tribological situations. But these are called conversion coatings because there is a chemical reaction that takes place at the surface, which converts the surface from metallic into a complex oxide or some other complex intermetallic form. We also can think of uh, thermal coatings, which are essentially coatings applied at high temperature. The very process of coating is uh, by exposing the entire substrate to high temperature so that uh, elements like carbon or nitrogen can diffuse in and it can be through um, a pack process or can be through a process which actually does not need any uh, diffusion at all, but with the existing amount of carbon you can 
apply certain phase transition and bring in a new phase onto the surface which can provide you high travel resistance against wear for example, flame, flame spraying or induction uh, hardening. We can have also metallic coatings. Uh, for example, we can use either by electrochemical process which typically we call electroplating or we can do it through electroless coating where we actually convert an oxide and allow certain elements to be diffused to the surface. So, processes are very similar sounding, but not exactly the same. We can also deposit directly a thin layer much less than of the order of a few micrometer or even less either by physical vapor deposition or by chemical vapor deposition. In physical vapor deposition, the composition of the target which is deposited onto the surface is the same as the, uh, as the coating that you develop. On the other hand, in chemical vapor deposition, you actually have a situation where uh, the species actually could be multiple and there could be reaction occurring in the vapor state and then a uh, reaction layer is deposited or the uh, species can diffuse to the surface and at the surface can lead to certain chemical reaction. We can also have organic coatings particularly on polymers or even on metallic substrates in the form of paints and lacquer which actually provides a protective layer against uh, any kind of scratch or other damages at room temperature. So, in all these processes be it diffusion coating, conversion coating or metal whatever we are discussing they all actually are um, based on the principles of diffusion. So, diffusion plays a very major role in uh, creating these coatings. So, what is the guiding principle for this? So, for diffusion coating we understand that uh, we are talking about high temperature process and uh, main intention is to uh, induce sufficient resistance against corrosion, oxidation, erosion, even in some cases wear and so on. So, the uh, coatings usually that are used are based on chromium, aluminum, silicon typically for high temperature uh, applications, high temperature resistance applications on super alloys like cobalt and nickel based super alloys or on titanium, on steel or refractory metals like molybdenum, tungsten, very high melting materials even they are prone to oxidation. So, you need certain coating to prevent oxidation of those metals. So, oxidation is essentially a degradation process which converts the precious metal into a non-usable form which is oxide because it is fairly brittle and uh, non-workable. The process is based on solid state diffusion as we have been saying uh, all along and the metal to be coated actually should have higher uh, uh, vapor pressure because then only it can go into the vapor state very easily and saturate the atmosphere around with the vapor of the desired species and which can subsequently get de deposited onto the surface in nascent form and then start diffusing. So, we need a hermetically sealed container because we do not want oxygen to sneak into the uh, chamber because we all are aware that oxygen immediately will react with metal surface at high temperature and create an oxide layer. Moments it, moment it forms an oxide layer of the base metal itself that oxide layer will actually create a barrier layer and the desired species say for example, aluminum or chromium or silicon will not be able to penetrate uh, a layer which is iron oxide on top of steel. So, the whole exercise will be futile. So, we have to make sure that the chamber is uh, not having oxygen or even if it has oxygen we should use some getters to kill that uh, oxygen residual oxygen and make it completely uh, 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 vacuum either in vacuum or completely a non oxidizing atmosphere or reducing atmosphere. So, um, we can um, so typically when we apply aluminum we call it aluminizing when we apply chromium we call it chrome plating, but this can be an when we, whenever we use the word plating it usually involves an aqueous uh, electrolyte or uh, even a vapor state. We can apply molybdenum and call it uh, molybdenizing or manganese and call it manganizing chrome calorizing this is a solid state process or uh, chrome titanium plating and so on. So, plating as I said is, is a typically an aqueous or electrochemical uh, process. Now, 
Zinc, chromium, copper are also very popular materials for coating, but these are usually done through some liquid medium or a liquid electrolyte and as a uh, they, are, they are a different subject altogether we will discuss separately when we discuss uh, electrochemical deposition or plating. And they are performed in tank furnaces, maybe at room temperature, maybe at high temperature. The other process that we alluded to is called chemical vapor deposition, where actually they are exposed to high temperature and then um, they can react in the vapor state and then deposit or at the surface can react with the base metal and create a different uh, composition. Now, just for comparison, I thought I would we should also refer to the uh, competitive and comparable diffusional processes. So, if you have a substrate say for example, it can be a low carbon steel, alloy steel, tool steel or stainless steel, various forms of steels with their own set of utilities very important with very important applications, possible applications. So, for low carbon steels you can think of carburizing or cyaniding when we are talking about uh, bringing in nitrogen or uh, nitro carburizing with when both nitrogen and carbon are introduced or carbonitriding depending on which is the preferred species. I mean nitro carburizing when nitrogen is preferred or carbonitriding when carbon is preferred. So, in one case we form um, carbonitrides on or, or compounds basically complex interstitial compounds and in some cases like here we can also have martensite along with those interstitial compounds. So, alloy steels actually uh, can, be exp can be coated with uh, nitriding or uh, iron nitriding process tool steels uh, which carry elements like titanium or uh, chromium or vanadium which have very high affinity for carbide formation. So, they can be <coughs> subjected to processes which can form some titanium carbides or boron various kinds of borides. Um, so, these processes like salt nitriding, iron nitriding, gas nitriding they can lead to formation of uh, coated layer onto the surface. On stainless steel, we can think of gas nitriding, titanium carbide formation, or iron nitriding and nitrocarburizing and so on. So, what is the difference or what is the um, uh, relevance here to this bring in all these subjects? They all are based on interstitial diffusion process. They also are diffusional processes, hence, they can be called diffusion coating, but they, are, they have their own names like nitriding, carbo carburizing, carbonitriding, and so on, just to distinguish the generic process of diffusional coating. So, whenever one talks about diffusion coating, typically we are talking about chromium, aluminum and uh, silicon which have very high affinity for oxygen and the process will be through substitutional diffusion and the application usually is high temperature protection. Whereas, these things actually all these processes can be um, uh, not necessary actually not for high temperature uh, protection, but for room temperature or slightly elevated temperature resistance to wear and other tribological purpose. So, the processes would require exposure to high temperature. We use a muffle furnace, a closed chamber uh, which uh, with certain uh, which can and then the subset the material to be coated is usually covered with powdered metal. We do it either in vacuum that means very low pressure, very low pressure, ultra low pressure or reasonably low pressure condition. So, the mechanism or the approach will require that we create the vapor species of these elements on um, iron, nickel or molybdenum or titanium uh, based substrates. We cover them. We can do it either through contact mode that means, pack processes where we pack it with powder or non-contact mode which is gaseous. So, gas percolates all over. Uh, there will be uh, reactions uh, occurring uh, which uh, subsequently which allows the desired species to go to the vapor state and then there will be decomposition of that vapor and then deposition of the nascent form of atoms of the desired species. So, typically um, uh, uh, this is the process used for very many systems, but there are also processes where we can have uh, we may use to we may need to use tank furnaces. So, we expose to high temperature and have a liquid bath in which the, uh, the metal uh, is to be dipped or um, immersed. So, uh, the thickness of the diffusion layer that we talk about can be several millimeters, can be fairly thick, 
but usually it's in the order of few tens at the most few hundred micrometers, less than a millimeter. Uh, because uh, uh, these diffusional coatings usually uh, create uh, not a very diffused interface. For example, when you compare them with carburizing or nitriding, in case of carbon or nitrogen, so if this is the uh, if this is the depth and uh, this is the concentration, then we in case of carbon and nitrogen we expect a diffusion profile like this. In case of silicon aluminum, so this is typically you expect in case of carbon and nitrogen. In case of silicon aluminum or these kind of substitutional species, this profile is diffusive, but then there is a, a certain drop. So, we do see a sharp interface between the coating and the substrate. So, this is the substrate. And this kind of a sharp interface actually creates uh, certain uh, stresses at the surface. So, if you actually make a very thick coating on a, on, on, on a substrate, then this stress that we generate, residual stress that we generate at the coating substrate interface is fairly large. And this stress can be much larger than the yield stress or the tensile stress of the material. And as a result, the coating may fall off, so which we do not want. So, we generally do not go for very thick coating, typically less than a millimeter at the most a few millimeters, but if needed you can make several millimeters. So, uh, pack cementation is a typical way in which, so what you do is you want for example, aluminum to go to the surface. So, you pack aluminum with sodium fluoride and at the reaction temperature they form aluminum fluoride because aluminum has higher affinity to fluorine uh, than sodium. So, this aluminum fluoride uh, is in the vapor state, but when it reaches the substrate surface, it tends to decompose and deposit aluminum. But this aluminum is in the nascent state and uh, when it releases uh, fluorine from aluminum fluoride, this fluorine goes back into the atmosphere, then again acts with uh, unreacted aluminum and forms again aluminum fluoride. So, this is how the fluorine is used up uh, in cyclic way, but since this is maintained at some um, evacuation, some evacuated condition or, uh, or, or there is always a possibility of uh, this gas uh, going into different parts of the chamber or being uh, sucked out by diffusional pump, the fluorine actually is an extremely corrosive material extremely corrosive agent. So, wherever it goes all the pump uh, uh, bearings or um, the pipings and so on they tend to get corroded. So, this process has to be done with certain amount of precaution, but the main process is to deposit aluminum in the nascent form and then aluminum diffuses. So, typically temperatures we are talking about could be 700 to 1100 degrees centigrade and this would be the kind of a zone that uh, uh, which uh, actually produces such kind of coatings. So, these are examples of small engineering components which actually can be subjected to such pack cementation process, but if you are thinking of a very large pipe uh, for carrying gas or any reactive material or petroleum or something, then the coating has to be done through a spray process like what you are seeing here. So, it is time to recapitulate. So, what all we have discussed? The whole process here is based on diffusion. So, we discussed the, the, the reason for diffusion, the driving force for diffusion and the kinetics of diffusion. And we understood that in most of the industrial practices, uh, we generally resort to non-steady state diffusion where the fixed second law is applicable and the typical um, uh, solution uh, under certain boundary conditions allows us to uh, predict the diffusion profile or composition profile both as a function of distance and time at a given depth and uh, that is what helps us to predict what would be the diffusion coating thickness for a particular condition. So, we actually can have various types of coatings possible and at the moment we are talking about diffusional coating. The main objective of diffusion coating is uh, to create these aluminum rich or chromium rich layers which actually when exposed to oxygen will form the oxide layer 
and uh, that would protect further oxidation. Um, the, the elements that are um, say for example, aluminum is appropriate for iron bearing substrates, but aluminum may not be appropriate for any other metal unless it has sufficient solubility in that metal. So, we have to select which exactly is the most appropriate one. So, among the three aluminum, chromium and silicon you choose elements depends upon the solubility and the kinds of phases they form uh, either a solid solution or intermetallic phases and we all are aware that intermetallic phases can cause a lot of stress at the surface. So, we may not quite want such elements to diffuse which have the tendency of formation of various types of intermetallic phases. So, carburizing nit and nit nitriding, carburizing and nitriding they are diffusional process. So, in principle one may argue that why not call them diffusion coating, but because their purpose and their um, uh, the whole process has a slightly different approach, we generally give them a different name. Um, we have discussed the uh, various uh, uh, laws applicable for diffusional kinetics, we have understood the differences between interstitial uh, diffusion and substitutional diffusion and we understood why the activation barrier is lower and hence the rate faster for interstitial diffusion than substitutional diffusion. And um, diffusional coating is more suitable for oxidation resistance than wear resistance is simply because uh, for uh, these the, the, um, the other processes competing processes like uh, carburizing or nitriding and so on, they are based on a particular mechanism which is not very stable at high temperature. Whereas, diffusion coating creates certain oxides particularly based on this chromium, aluminum and uh, silicon where these oxides are very stable at high temperature and can protect the substrate from further oxidation. So, they are more suitable for high temperature oxidation resistance. So, we come to the end of this lecture now and now after this we will discuss specifics of uh, aluminum coating or chromium coating or silicon coating for high temperature oxidation resistance. Thank you very much.